All right, so today I want to go into something that's really important, and that is, uh, any of you are, know what the abbreviation RPA stands for? Residential Purchase Agreement. Residential Purchase Agreement. All right, so you heard of that before, Residential Purchase Agreement. So we're going to go over that, and then we're going to go into something that Gina is going to help us on with a part of the Residential Purchase Agreement. But before I do that, I want to just ask this question. I want you all to, uh, how many of you brought your, your smartphones with you? Anybody bring your smartphone? Nope. All right. Okay, you got your smartphone? You didn't bring it? Okay. All right. Okay, so um, residential purchase agreement, but if you want to be successful in real estate, if you want to be successful in life, you need to ask yourself, what is your plan? Do you have a plan? And many folks do not have a plan, and so what happens is they ended up uh, working on other people's plans. You need to have your own plan. And some of us, we find that it's difficult, even when we have a plan, for our plan to be executed properly. And I want you to know that those of us who have a plan will re re receive the rewards from that plan much faster if we begin to hold ourselves accountable to that plan. Give yourself some timelines and all that, so it's important. What's also important is to know that you're not in this alone. So with that, I'm going to go into something that I uh, listen to a lot. It's a it's a Bible scripture, and um, this is the, this is uh, there's this guy named uh, Jeremiah, and uh, God was telling Jeremiah. Jeremiah had a tough time. God was telling Jeremiah that you know um, I have a plan for you, Jeremiah. And most of us, you know, who have any kind of relationship with God, we're just afraid that we're going to mess up and, and miss out. Right, because we messed up. But God is a forgiving God. That's what I want you to know. And his plan for us is he's not just waiting around to say, Mel, gotcha, I gotcha. You know what? He's there to help us. And, and I want you to know, he says here, for I know the plans I have for you, the plans are for good. So Maggie, you're not in this alone. <laughs> Your plans are good. They're plans for good and not for a disaster. So I want you to realize that God does not have a plan to just trip you up and hope you mess up. He wants you to get it right. And a plan that will give you a future and a hope. Right? A future and hope. I've seen so many people who decided that there's no reason to hope anymore and they've given up on life. Uh, I have a number of friends who are in the military and they're losing friends, colleagues like crazy. I talked to a friend of mine who went to a birthday party for his four-year-old child uh, about a week ago. And he's in the Marine Corps, and he said, you know what, Mel, there were like 250-some people uh, who were in, uh, came over to Afghanistan when I, uh, you know, was uh, assigned there, and many of them came back. But he says, you know, we've lost 24 of them. 24 of them. But they were lost through self-inflicted wounds. Wow. Suicide. 24 out of 255 have committed suicide. And so essentially what happens when people get to that point where they want to give up on life is they've lost hope. They have no belief that things are going to get better. They think things actually will get better if they just take themselves out. So I want you to know that there's a lot of disparity and, and uh, depression out there. And we need to hold up our men and women of the armed forces because they went through a lot of trauma in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and the Persian Gulf one uh, incident, and even Vietnam from folks from my era. And so just realize that God has a plan for you, and it's a good plan. Sorry, William. That's all right. Uh, in those days when you pray, God says that I will listen. And if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. So any of you, well, when you were a kid, I remember one of the games we used to play, especially in the summertime when, you know, everything was hot, including, you know, when I was going through puberty, everything was really hot. And then you were like, you know, it was like, uh, let's go play hide and go seek. Let's go play hide and go seek. And then you'd always be trying to not be found, right? Well, God doesn't play hide and go seek. He says that when you search for him, you'll find him. You'll find him. So all you have to do is look for him wholeheartedly, in other words, earnestly. And you don't have to be perfect. You could have made all kinds of mistakes, as I have. Okay? And know that he is there to help you. All right? So I'm almost done with this. And it says, 
I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. How many would like to have a fortune? Anybody here? Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of you are a liar. <laughs> you know you want some money in your bank, right? So I want you to know that you're not in this alone. Sometimes it seems like nothing's going right. It seems like you have a bunch of people around you who are not really pulling for you. Uh, in fact, what's so sad is that sometimes those people are the people who actually live with you. They're afraid that they're going to lose you if you become very successful. They're afraid that you're going to outgrow them. And so they kind of help sabotage your, your career by feeding these little things like, oh, you'll never do it. Don't you know real estate is really hard? Nobody is doing good in real estate. Oh, this is a terrible time. The economy is bad. And, you know, why are you doing that? Why don't you, you have a degree. Well, why don't you go get a degree? You know, they'll tell you all these different things to plant these little seeds. And a large part of it is because they're insecure. They're afraid that they're going to lose you. They're afraid that when you become extremely successful, you're not dependent on them anymore. And so I want you to realize that it's okay to be successful. It's okay to help a lot of people. It's okay to have a lot of money. It's okay to have a bank account that's like bling bling. It's okay to have that. It's okay to have a tax problem where you made so much money you don't know what to do with it and now you have to go invest in real estate. I just closed the transaction. I think I showed James a property uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm concerned. I'm concerned that uh, at the end of this year, if I don't do something, I'm going to owe a lot of taxes. So I decided to go out and invest and buy a property. And I'm doing a lot of renovative work now. It's probably going to cost me about $30,000 to get it all fixed up. But that $30,000 is coming from real estate commissions, transactions. Not from your commission, but transactions that I represent buyers and sellers on. I'm very fortunate that I've had 11 transactions closed so far this year. Way, way, way below my goal. But how did So you guys set your goals high, okay? Don't be afraid to dream. Uh, don't let anybody else kill your dreams. And if you're around people who uh, really are not supportive of your dream, Stop sharing your dreams with them. Just hold them to yourself and share them with other people who are going to be supportive. And this could be the person you sleep with. It could be your loved one. It could be your, your kids. It could be your parents. There are a lot of folks who just don't believe like you believe, right? So if, if they're around you, and I really love your haircut. Thank uh, you. <laughs> they're around you and um, they're not supportive. Don't get mad at them. Just realize that this is their own insecurity, their own disbelief or lack of faith. And don't be mad at them. Just love them. Love on them. Okay? But just don't share your dreams with them because we don't want to see you uh, get sabotaged by someone else's uh, lack of faith. All right. So that being said, I'm going to move on into where we're going to go with our class today. And Miss Gina, I tell her that one day when I become really successful, I'm going to hire her to be my Vanna. Yes, Vanna White, this is wrong. <laughs> so this is a purchase agreement, a residential purchase agreement, an RPA. And all of us, uh, at one time or another, are going to have one of these with our name on it. Okay? And hopefully it'll be here, your name on it, when you're buying a property too. How many of you would like to buy another property? Anybody here? Wouldn't that be cool to buy another property? Cool. All right, so on the RPA, there's a lot of different contingencies and disclosures that we have in here. And at the end of this month, by the way, we're going to have uh, an attorney uh, who will come in and explain the changes in the residential purchase agreement because there are some significant changes that are going on. Okay, so look on the calendar on our, our website. You go to the back end of our website, you sign as your agent login, and you'll see a calendar that tells you all the classes that we're going to be having, okay, coming up for the re <coughs> remainder of this month. And before I forget, this is a publication that once you join the local association of realtors, you become a member of the California Association of Realtors and then also the National Association of Realtors. There is a convention that's coming up in the month of October. I think it starts around October 6th, the week of October 6th this year. And it's right close by. It's in next door to Disneyland. So all of you, and you've just recently been here, right? all of you who uh, live within 60 miles of this place, I want you all to go down here. We're going to schedule a date out, and I want you to go to an event that we're going to have at the California Association of Realtors. Please bring lots of your business cards because it's a great networking opportunity. So we're going to go. 
those of you who are willing to step out of your comfort zone, you get on the train. Some of us have ridden the train down before on Broadway. That's right. Yeah, we've had a great time riding that. There's an Amtrak station uh, in, in Chatsworth, and there's a Metrolink station right here in Northridge. Okay, so it's easy to get to, and it stops right in by there. So I want you to set a date to, to go. We're going to have a date. I think it's probably going to be like uh, around this, the maybe the 8th or 9th of October. But we'll send that date out to you. And then what I'm going to invite you to do is all participate in something there that day. And then I'm going to invite all of you out to lunch. Okay, we're going to find, find a nice venue to have lunch. And guess what? It's free lunch. lunch. It's one of your few, few free lunches. Come on in, Floyd. Uh, can you guys all slide over one more? Free and lunch. Floyd <laughs> free lunch. Free lunch. Floyd comes in on the right cue. Free lunch. Free and he walked in. Yeah. yeah. Can you all just slide down one? Slide down one. 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 Slide that way. Yeah, nice stand up. Up. <laughs> All right, so he's bringing another chair in. So before I forget, let's just see. Um, okay, Gina, what's your birthday? Uh -oh. Not the year, but the day. Yeah, I wasn't going to give away the year. <laughs> February 16. February 16. So the first person, well, I should say the first, the person whose birthday is the closest to Gina's birthday. He's going to get this Starbucks uh -huh. gift card. So, February what? 16. Like you know, I like you. <laughs> My wife's birthday is February 4th. No, I like you. Uh -huh. uh, see that? All right, February 16th. Anybody's birthday close to February 16th? Yes, what's yours? 18. Oh. Oh. How about it for James? All right, so Gina, I'm almost ready to introduce you in here. This is the residential purchase agreement. Can somebody focus this and get a little bit more refined focus there? Rodney, if you can do that for me. All right, on this uh, purchase agreement, there are a lot of different disclosures. That's good, right there. There are a lot of different timelines and disclosures. I want you guys to get familiar. Those of you who've been around for a while, you know they're, they're here. So this is the last gift card here. And this is only for those who were here on time or Lily. early. Who's here on time or early? Rodney? William. Gina? <laughs> William? James? Nairi? Okay. William was the first one here. Double Martin? Yeah. Deborah? All right, so Deborah, all, you stand up all the ones that were here on time or early. Okay, let's please stand. All right, okay. Now, on this residential purchase agreement, there is a line item that talks about the preliminary title report. Okay? There's about 20 something line items. Which one is it? Which line item is closest to that talks about the preliminary title report? Anybody here know? No? All right, we'll have a sit down. We'll, we'll give another question before it's all over. Uh, uh, Lillian says the third page, so I'm going to go to the third page, Lillian, and guess what? It's not on the third page, but good guess. It, I believe it's on the first page. You believe it, but your belief is not correct. That's okay. All right, what page number is this? Page four. It says title investing within the specified time, uh, specified paragraph. 14 buyers shall provide, provided a preliminary title report, which shall include a what? A search of the general, general indexes. Okay. So that's where this comes into play. So with that, I'm going to introduce to you the star for today, Gina Valdivia. For some of you, this is, I realize this is very repetitive, William, and, <laughs> and Bill, but this is, I want you to get your pens out and make notes if you have to and keep this with you all the time, because guess what's going to follow you on every transaction? Freeland. Why is it important? to look at your prelims, you can tell me. Why is it important to not just say, oh, S is going to take care of that? William. Because the preliminary title report usually includes things like tax liens, 
and um, the fees recorded against the property, which becomes important because the, the amount of the deeds add up to more than the price you're trying to sell the property for, you got a problem. Mm -hmm. If you haven't set it up in a short sale. This is true. Now, did everybody notice in the residential purchase agreement how it mentioned general indexes? Right? We just read that? Mm -hmm. General indexes, if somebody can tell me the answer to this, gets a gel highlighter. What document is it so important to get, I think, when you're doing that listing, you know, you're getting somebody to sign the listing agreement, what is so smart and, and just to get out of the way, what document that you're going to give to escrow and you're going to give to title that's going to make everybody's job so much easier? So does SPQ? SPQ? No. Statement of information. Yeah, thank oh, yeah. you. Otherwise known as an SI. Now, it's a piece of paper. It has personal information on it. It's going to ask your social security number. It's just so much easier to get it done in the beginning. Get it to escrow, and escrow can get it to title. Why? Because if we order a prelim without it, they're going to search the property, the property address, and you're going to get a prelim with either everything on it, because your person is named Smith, or it's it's going to say in here. There's a part in here that says this is this is not a complete report, and it's not a complete report until we get the SI. Why? Because things record against the social security number and the person's name, as well as a property address. So until we get that SI, there's a whole other search we have to do. How many people in here have had a transact this threatened? I just want to interject this in because now. It's the perfect time when you get that SI to uh, get your client's telephone number, email address, birthdays, for yeah. your later on follow-up contact. You know, when they bought the house, now they're in the property. Years later, you want to stay in touch with them. That would be an excellent opportunity. That's a very good marketing point. But until we get that SI, and the reason I'm trying to really ingrain this in you, I have been in this business over 20 years. And I can't tell you how many times I work with realtors, realtors who are very experienced. They're great realtors, and I get a call. Gina, our escrow's closing, and we came up with a child support lien. When's the escrow closing? Tomorrow. The escrow's closing in two days. You don't ever want to have that happen, and it's preventable. Because if you look at your prelim, and a lot of people say, oh, escrow's going to look at it. And escrow's wonderful, and escrow can catch 99.9 .9 of everything. But look at your program, which we're going to open right now, and it's not a scary thing. And this is where I come in, too. If you see something weird on this prelim, don't be afraid to call me. Just call me and say, what is this? Most of the time, it's not going to matter. But you want to get everything out of the way and up front so you can have a smooth and easy closing, right? You don't want to have to be jumping and taking care of problems and be stressing at the end of the escrow. It's not a pretty picture. But... If you keep this with you, I mean, prelims are pretty straightforward. The first page of the prelim is telling you your name and address, some basic things. And if you notice in the bottom of the sample prelim, it has an explanation for everything that's going on on the top. So if you ever get a prelim and you're looking at it and you're trying to figure out what's what, go to the bottom of this, keep this with you, and I want all of you to write in here too later. Keep this with you and refer to this. And or call me or the title officer or escrow and just ask us, say, hey, what is this? And, you know, get it out of the way. Don't lose sleep over it. The next page, which is Schedule B, is everybody at Schedule B? Mm -hmm. You've got your taxes, mm -hmm. right? The next thing is a lien for defaulted taxes, which have to be paid at close. Sometimes that can be a lot of money if you're dealing with a short sale or you're dealing with somebody who hasn't paid taxes. You want to know what that amount is, right? Sure. You want to be aware of that. A lien for supplemental taxes. You're going to see that and your client could call you and say, what the heck? What is this lien for supplemental taxes? That's usually due to a conveyance. In other words, it's usually due to when somebody transfers property. Let's just say you have an investor and he buys a property. And the city is going to assess that property, say, every October once a year. Well, your investor has bought the property and sold it before the county could get their assessment in for the new purchase price. 
So what happens is somebody else buys the property, and your guy's going to get a bill for supplemental taxes later, which were his because what we do is we say, no, these were assessed when he owned the property. And a lot of people have a big stink over it, but that's, it is what it is, right? And that's usually what a supplemental tax bill is. But it can be other things too. But you want to be aware of that. And if it's not something that belongs there, then that's something that needs to be taken off. CCNRs, everybody knows what CCNRs are? Covenants, conditions, and restrictions. No. Where it says you can have a white fence, but you can't have a purple fence kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, now, item 15. Why is it so important to look at the easements? Can anybody give me an example? Floyd? You put your spot on the back wall and get it all decked out, and you got five feet that you're not supposed to be building there. So. And usually, what is that five feet? Uh, Utilities. Utility easements. Very good. So most often you're going to see utility easements, which are very common. It's nothing to worry about unless your, your buyer's planning on building something in the last five feet. Because the utility companies want to be able to put their poles in, want to be able to do that kind of thing. What easement, you should always look at the easements because there's a, there's a particular easement that can cause a lot of problems or not. And that is for ingress and egress. That means it's an easement that other people can use to get in and out of the property. Now, especially if you're dealing with a Box Canyon property or a Malibu property, any property, you want to be able to know, oh my gosh, there's an easement, and make sure your buyer knows that there's an easement that people can, can use, right? Otherwise, you're going to get a call later and say, there's people driving over my property. <laughs> well, I, you know, that kind of thing. So just be aware of the easements, look at the easements. Glance over them. Right? Not scary so far? Flag light. Box Canyon. Flag light. Flag light. Yeah. Flag light would be part of too, right? Especially if you're dealing with the flag light, you're going to have easements for ingress and egress. There is a plat map in here that's included with your prelim. It's a good idea to know who can tell me from the assessor's parcel number which part of the assessor's parcel number is going to tell you which your little circled number parcel is on your flat map? Last. Book page. Who said that? I was going to say last two. Last two. Very good. So you can go to your taxes, look at the assessor's parcel number, and look at your flat map and line them up. Don't look at this example because for some reason my company gave me a Santa Clara flat map with an LA County <laughs> parcel number. So when I looked this morning, I kept putting on my glasses and saying, what? But normally, it's the book, page, and parcel, and you want to compare your APN to the plat map so you make sure that that lines up. Some other kind of things, scary things that you should be aware of in here. Let's see. Gee, number 19 is a tough one. Well, first of all, you've got your deeds. Number, number nine and number 10, you've got your first and your center, right? What William was talking about, number nine and number 10, you've got a first and then you've got a second behind it, right? It's in second position. So you see exactly what's on there. You might look at something and say, wait a minute, that second's not on there. But if somebody has a line of credit for $100,000, even if they don't use it, until we get a demand that says that there's zero balance, we have to include that because there could be a balance on it. Somebody could say, hey, there's no balance, and two days before close, you know, you go out, you put $50,000 on the credit line, and until we get a zero balance demand, that's just gonna show up. And guess what? If there is a zero balance, then nobody has anything to worry about. It's gonna show up as a zero balance, and everything should be fine. So, you wanna look at your deeds, an abstract of judgment, this is, this is really crucial because if you have a judgment on your prelim, until you get a satisfaction of judgment, this is not leaving. It means that there's some kind of judgment through the court where there's been an award, and unless it's taken, unless there's a satisfaction of judgment or it's paid, your house will not close. So if you, see an, if you see an abstract of judgment, we can usually look it up, we can find out a little bit more about it, and then you're gonna have to go back to your seller and say, hey, we've got this here, and you're gonna, it's, it has to be a discussion. Mel, have you had any issues with that ever? Yes. And how did you handle it? Regarding the satisfaction of judgment? 
I had to go back and see if the bill had been paid off, and if so, went back to the creditor to get them to sign off and have it notarized, an actual set abstract for satisfaction of judgment, so it could be given back to your company, and then they can release it from the title record. And why do we want to release it? Because we're issuing insurance. We don't want to be responsible for whatever that amount is. It could be $1,000, it could be $100,000, we don't know. So until we get that abstract of judgment, and it sounds like it wasn't done yet, so you had to go through the whole process right. of getting it done, which can take a lot of time, that has to be done. So, so far we're looking at taxes, we're looking at the deeds. How many of you get profiles? When you get a list, you get a profile, right? And you look at the deeds, and what's the other important to look at thing to look at on the profile when you're going on a listing appointment? The most important thing, really. Owners of record. Owners of record. Do you know how many times I've heard people have gone out and they've had an entire listing presentation and they realize that they're, they're not, not talking, talking to the owner? They're not talking to the owner. <laughs> so, yeah, so you want to make sure they're the owners of record. And, and if they're not, is there a trust? Do they represent the owners of record? Who are the people you're meeting with? Because you don't want to waste your time. And everything, everything I'm telling you is a time saver. So dig into this. And if you need more help with it, you can always ask me. You can sit down. You can, you know, when you get your prelim. When you get a listing, order your prelim. I suggest that from me. <laughs> Did you like that? I winked at the end. Order your prelim from me. I will help you with it. It will come directly to you before it goes to escrow. And then when it goes to escrow, we can have everything worked out and looked at before it even gets to escrow. So when you get to escrow, you are sweat free. You are good to go. You know everything that's in there. There are no surprises. And it's cool, calm, cool, and collected. When you get the prelim, you can call me to a I have no idea what I'm looking at. Can you help me? And we'll get through it. So, so far we're looking at taxes. We're looking at deeds. We're looking at any odd things like uh, well, easements. Utility easements are usually OK. You want to look for ingress and egress. Abstract of judgment. Now, number 12 is a federal tax lien. These come up all the time, but guess what? They usually don't come up until we get a social security number because they're recorded against the name and social security number, not the property address. So I mean, this is another pesky issue that until we get the SI, this isn't going to show up. So, I mean, federal tax liens can be huge, and they are not going off unless they're paid or unless you get a release of lien showing that it has been paid. And more often than not, when it shows up, and you can ask your people, do you have anything, do you have anything? No, no, no. And then guess what else pops up? Child support lien. Those do not go away. And you know, you get into a thing of how much you know is paid and how much is owed and what's happening. And you get into court documents. This can take a lot of time. But a lot of this stuff is found on the SI. So that's why it's so important in that SI in the beginning, right? Federal tax lien is a, is a scary one. This one says it's only $720. A lot of times people just say, yes, it's mine. We're just going to pay it through the close of escrow, which is fine. If you have an abstract of judgment and it hasn't been paid, but you know how much it is, you pay it through escrow if it hasn't been paid. That's fine, too. But it's got to either be a satisfaction of judgment or pay through escrow, a release of a lien or pay through escrow. I've heard you say a few times that it's the person's name and social security number. So is this a report based on the individual selling or buying? It's a report based on the property address of the house. So we're actually searching any records that pop up on the property address. Mm -hmm. But we also need to search the person's name and social security number for things that could possibly affect the property. Okay which could be child support liens, okay. you know, uh, and until you get the SIN, a lot of times the SI usually, I don't even want to say that, it, it's not an issue sometimes because the last name could be really complicated and we can run it if we don't have an SI yet. We can kind of see, oh, there's nobody in that with that name in the system, so we're probably okay. But if you're dealing with this, like the last name of Smith, you know, we've got to go through tons of records to look through there to eliminate stuff that's not your buyer. Sometimes you'll get a prelim and it will have a lot of stuff on it. 
and you're going to go bananas and say, this is not my person's stuff. Okay, well, we, as soon as we get the SI, we can eliminate all those items and issue an update, and all of those will come off. That's happened to some people in here, too. Yes. Maybe to help clarify, <clears throat> um, when they fill out the statement of information, mm -hmm. And as Gina said, you know, they use that to begin research again. What they're using it for simply is to research the public records okay. that are not attached directly to the property. Okay. okay. So there's all these public records out there that have the person's name or their social security number. And those are why they that those are the things that are going to come up when they search the public records. But because federal tax liens in real estate take priority as getting paid, mm -hmm. you know, that's something that wouldn't necessarily be recorded against the property, but would be a public record. And the same thing with the child support oh. liens. So, and so maybe for the research of public record it makes it more understandable. It does. Okay. Thank you. So when you order a prelim, it goes to my company, they put the address in, if they have an SI, they'll put in do a general index search, which is separate than the property search. Oh, we're going to search the property. We're going to, all the documents are going to come up through public records that pertain to that property. We're going to put them all in a report, goes to word processing, and that's just very simple, the report that's generated. A lot of times we don't get the SI till later. We get the SI and we have to search that, and then we can do an amendment, either you know saying this is the report, or we can add things because we've also searched in the general indexes the social security and name. And sometimes people on the SI will put like they have to put uh, previous addresses, mm -hmm. and we'll run those too. And sometimes we'll find things under those. So this report is kind of like okay, what needs to be paid. You know, are there any lawsuits? Are there anything going on where, you know, it's a little concise report of that? Okay. That makes sense? Yes. But it's all a matter of everything we're looking at is public record. Okay. We're not doing anything secret or <laughs> we don't have any secret ways of going in there. Yes, right. You know, I don't want to waste time, but I also think that the sooner you find out what liens on the property, what's owed on the property, because a lot of time I found out that some homeowners, they don't know what they owe, and so, uh, when, you, when they find out that they got to uh, pay all this stuff, not their bottom line, what they expected when you went out on a listing appointment and you had your head and tried to explain them what kind of money they can put in their pocket, the sooner you know about these prelims and what's on title to this property, the sooner you can report back to them, look, this got to be paid, that has to be paid, yes. and it could make the difference of closing the escrow or not. Yeah, absolutely. Don't fall into the trap of Oh, escrow's ordering the prelim and they're going to take care of it. We've got great escrow officers, but be your own best friend and knowledge is power. And look at the prelim, educate yourself, and just you know, sleep easier at night knowing that you've taken care of it. But the SI, make sure you, you know, get the SI and have that done. Yes? Um, one of the things that I make it a practice of when I do get the prelim is to make sure that my owner gets a copy of it from me too, besides from escrow. I mean, if it comes from me, he looks at it. If it comes from escrow, he thinks, oh, just, that's just tough, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm going to give you an example of another thing, and actually it, it, it wasn't on here, but my listing on White Oak was a, was a trust, uh, a living trust. And what had happened is when the... The, the, the mother died, they rewrote the trust, but all the deeds were in that joint living trust. And then the trust got rewritten and with a new name. And so when it came time to draw up the grant deed, escrow was drawing up the grant deed with the old trust name, but this was the, it had been changed, but that recording of the new trust to attach it to the property didn't occur. Now, because I gave this to my seller, he says, damn it, I've been trying to straighten that out for two years. <laughs> okay, so the point was, is he already knew about it, and now he knew he really had to get on the ball and get it resolved, and it got resolved. But again, it was something that only came up because it showed up on the prelim. Yes. You know, and he recognized the difference. I didn't. I didn't know there was 
something else. So because you gave him a copy of the prelim, he looked at it, which is Actually, I take that back. I take that back. When I had him fill out the trust advisory for the listing, for the trust listing, there was a place where he filled in the name of the trust, and what he filled in in that form mm -hmm. was different than what was on the prelim. Mm -hmm. right. Which brings me to another point, and I'm not trying to just, I'm trying to keep the information to a minimum because I know it's a lot, but that's why you can call me and go, Gee, my God, I prelim and there's something, what is this? And I can totally take care of it for you. Um, if there's a trust involved, more often than not, we're going to need a copy of the trust. Sure. Because we have to see, if, especially if there's been conveyances going on, we have to make sure that certain people have the right to do certain things. So keep in mind, if you are taking a listing and there is a trust involved, you're going to have to get a copy of that trust and you're going to have to get it to us and that needs to be reviewed sometimes before we can make decisions about what can and cannot be on the three left. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. A copy of the original? A copy of the trust. The original like in death certificates. Right. And when we're getting into, you know, serious matters, she'll say we need to see, you know, certain things and that, that's a whole other class. <laughs> No, That's all. Come back. She wants to come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other. Okay. So, am I taking up too much time? No, but they're they're taking up a lot of your time. Okay. <laughs> so, but it's it is it is valid. So, I mean, basically, that's a nutshell. And then there's a few other things in here that you don't see that often. Uh, you know, a lien for solid waste for three hundred eighty-seven dollars, which you know is self-explanatory. Lean for civil administration, um, you know, for you know, just different things in here, and these are all things that are going to have, they're going to have to be addressed at some point. So you just want to look, you want to look at your liens. Um, what's something real quick that I mentioned that's critical that you need to look for and address? Somebody. Say that again. Something I mentioned. What is a critical item that needs to be addressed once you see it in the prelim? Yes, thank you. Hey, the newbie! All right. <laughs> What's another? What is another thing that needs to be addressed? You guys need to make you guys need to make notes. What did you say, Lily? Okay, what do you do when you get a listing? Encroach? What? what? Encroachment? Do the statement of information order a title report. Order a title report! <laughs> Woo! Joe highlighter. Does anybody have any questions? I know some of you are new and you, you know, when you go through the process, you can call me and I can help you through it as well. And we can do it together. Um, has anybody, have you had any issues? I know you've been doing this for a long time. Do you want to have do any questions from you? Yeah. yeah. Virgil. <laughs> Virgil. 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 Well, Virgil, wait, Virgil's probably got a lot of oh, Virgil. Does anybody have any good stories for us about things that happened or any questions? Mel? <laughs> no, I just think that timing is critical. Get the statement of information right away. Yes, right Turn away. it in because you will be very disappointed uh, when you work for a month and a half on a transaction and you find out there's some obstacle that you cannot overcome within a timeline that you have to overcome it. So just... Or that you can't up. overcome. Right. That's right. And then, you're, you know, all your work is for naught. So these are important. Call me, let me know what I can do to help you. And um, I think that I pretty much nutshell it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The desk, oh, the desk calendars are there. One more thing I'm going to clear up um, that I know you guys might need. Uh, excuse me. And she's my title rep. So which I think you guys are already taking the, the buyers and sellers guides are here. Let me know as you need more. Um, the desk calendars are there. Please help yourself. And if you need to take an extra one for a home office, that's absolutely OK. And thank you, Mel, for having me. Okay, how about you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are at our appointed time for those of us who came for this class. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to stay around, we're going to have a more detailed uh, look at a uh, residential purchase agreement, some of the disclosures and title things. But for the rest of you, uh, who brought the baklava? Rodney. Yeah. Rodney did? <laughs> he took credit anyway. <laughs> I took credit. That's no language. Did you break these?
Or you bought them? No, no, I, I bought them. I didn't you make it. No. Okay. How about for an RV for them? Okay. So uh, we are at the end of this meeting. Uh, for those of you who want to take a potty break, uh, we'll show you where that's at. And then we'll be back here in about five minutes, and we'll be here for another half hour after that.